I just put the uh, Lecture 16 notes online a whopping like 10 minutes ago. But this is basically a continuation of the last class. So we're going to keep going on Matplotlib, PyProj, and look some more at the GPS data. And in fact, Andy McLeod right now is working on a data set for us where he's got three GPSs up on the roof, all on a big bar, and they're going to get raised up together. And the idea is to compare the accuracy of the three different GPSs recording the same sky over a few days and each going through a few steps and see if we can actually uh, distinguish the vertical difference between each of those steps and see how each of the GPSs do. And they're uh, some pretty radically different GPSs, so it'll be interesting to see the results of that experiment. We, we think we know what's going to happen, but we don't never really know until you give it a shot. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and create myself a new class 16 directory. If you don't already have it, I'm going to go re-get that file from last time, the data file that we had. So under examples, way down here in the giant mess of stuff, there should be examples. And we're going to get the 2011 gga.dat. So you can do a wget paste, and that should grab the data. Or you can do a save as and move it around. So it's this third one down here, the gga.dat.bz2. So I would right click on it, save the link, and then you can do the wget command in the directory you want to be in and then paste the URL. Or you can save it into your class 16. It looks very strange. So is there an examples directory down below? Yeah. So if you scroll down just a little bit, examples. Yep. And so I just saw it on yours. So then right click on that 2011. Yep. That. And then put that into a directory. So it's opening. They're stuck. So if you do file, close. Um, I'm going to show you something really quick. Go up to your terminal, type control U to clear, or that works too. Yep. Control U does the same thing as backing up. Mm -hmm. Type X kill, X and then K I L L. Your cursor changed. Click on this window and it's going to kill it. So X kill is a, is a command that if you want something to go away for sure, <laughs> it's pretty effective. So keep running until all your Emacs are gone and then. So they're all going to be stuck, probably. So do X kill on all of them. And then let me know when you're done. Don't try this if your machine is working right. X kill is a program where you're all using what's called the X window system. It's the display thing that handles windows and widgets and whatnot. It's called X11. And Windows, the term Windows before Microsoft Windows meant something completely different. X kill changes your cursor to a little X, or if, if the system set up right, a little skull and crossbones. And the next window that you click on will get destroyed very aggressively. It will, in fact, detach it from the screen and it just goes kapoof. So if like your Emacs is completely stuck and something's going wrong, uh, you can run xkill, no options, your cursor changes. Be very careful what you click on next because whatever you click on next goes goodbye. So when you click, once. it just works once. So you got to run it a couple different times. That's a great question. What happens if your computer is acting OK? Sometimes a process will get stuck. With, especially with big software, there's chances for things to get completely wedged in some really odd case that's hard for the software developers to figure out. If that happens, then this is a way on a Linux system to destroy a particular program for sure. And there's other ways to do it, but this is the way that you just, if, if you see the window and it's being unhappy, you can just force it to die. It's, it's really aggressive. The 2011 10 11 GGA.dat. So I'm going to start over kind of from last time, and we're going to go through creating that function again, just because seeing functions being written multiple times is not a bad thing. So I'm going to start from scratch in an Emacs window inside of the 16 directory. So the easiest way to do is just to control X, control F, and then down here just type if you've got class 16 made. Since I don't have anything showing up there, I'm going to hit a G to refresh since we're in directory edit mode, and you'll see the data file appear. I'm going to keep going through the Emacs commands for the rest of the semester until you're tired of hearing them and you shout me down. So I'm going to do a control X2, so I can keep that around. Control X, control F, and we're going to call it wander. And I'm going to give it the number 2, just so in case anyone is confused between lecture 15 and lecture 16, wander2.py. We're going to catch up to where we were last time. So I'm going to start with the basic beginning of a script, user bin env python. 
We're going to import the modules that we're going to use. So we're going to import PyProj. This is our, uh, our projection slash geometry on a sphere, great circle distance library. We're also going to use NumPy for arrays and our text function. Again, I'm going to use that alias NumPy as NP so we can refer to it as NP. And I'm going to bring in two more that I'll be using later on, sys. And I'm going to show you something slightly different here, that you can say comma and a couple different libraries. So we're going to have the sys and the OS modules coming in here in case we want to use them later on. We'll see how we're doing and whether or not I want to give that a go. So let's go ahead and start creating our wander list function again. So def is the beginning of a definition of a function. Then we're going to give it the name. So wander underscore list and file name. So this is our function name. And then this is going to be our list of arguments. We just have one. We're going to pass in the file name that we want to open. And we'll start off with just print working on file colon file name. This is not in the notes, but this is something I typically do when writing software so that I know that the function I meant to start began. And you'll see a lot of programmers put a little print statement at the beginning of a function and a print at the end of the function. And then when you run the code, you can see the function start and stop. And it's just kind of a little debugging trick. We may get into the debugger in this class later on, but typically you can debug programs just by putting print statements inside of the code and then watching the stuff print out to the screen. Save that. And we're going to go ahead and just run that basic little part first to make sure we're good. So I'm going to do a con uh, just a G down here without the control. And I'll now see my wander2.py appear. I've been talking to people trying to figure out whether or not this dash dash pylab stuff is good or bad. I didn't like it, but I was trying to do it to follow other people's convention. And I'm going to give up on dash dash pylab. And we'll see how I do. I might have to revert back to trying it out and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to say ipython and I'm not going to give it the dash dash pylab this time. And the trouble is is that it imports a bunch of stuff and doesn't tell us. So then well, later on like when you're trying to find load text, where did it come from? It's very confusing to follow. Uh, we've had a number of people vote for not doing that anymore because then they tried to follow the, the notes and give it a go and didn't really work. So there's ipython. And we're going to say ls, make sure we've got our wander2.py sitting right in there. And we can go ahead, import wander2. Import wander2. And now we've brought our module in. Just as a reminder, from now on, once you've loaded in the first time into IPython, for then after you need to reload it when you make changes. So we'll do, just to show you, reload wander2. And that will bring it in any changes. So let's go ahead and say, dir wander and see what's in. So go back to your Emacs window and I'll show you what you're missing. You're missing one little tiny bit of punctuation. There's a comma in between the string and the file name. We're just using prints and I haven't really explained too much about print. We'll start getting into prints and fancy string stuff down the road as we need, really, really need it. So hopefully if you do that and then do a reload, it should work. So if you do the dir of wander2, You'll see wander list and then your other modules that you brought in in there. So we can say wander2 dot wander list and then we can give it a file name. So we'll say single quote two zero and then press tab and it will complete that file name. So it looked in the current directory and found there was a matching file name and gave it to us. This is why I love IPython. If you press enter, it's now going to give us that little print statement. And it should say print, it would be a working on file colon and then our file name. So kind of helpful to have the program tell you as you're going. Have you imported your module? No, no. So import wander. The typo as, so go up here, let's see what we've no. got. Oh, there, import numpy as np. And then import sys, it's not as, that's os for operating system. First thing I got was no module named OS. And was, there's a space. Um, that's that. a comma, not a period. Ah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, if I make the font any bigger up there, I will have no room to write, but it's hard to see the little. Okay. And then I can do uh, just load. Or now you need to do a reload. Go back through and watch the classes and pay particular attention to where the tilde is used. 
it's, it gets a little confusing because that's an alias typically, but you've actually put it into file names. So let's go back through the projection stuff that we're going to do. So we need to create a geode object. So I'm going to hit enter. And remember, Emacs is your friend in terms of the indentation for Python. When I was at the end here and I hit enter, it indented four spaces for me automatically. Let it do that for you. And if you don't have the right indentation, if you're right here, you can press tab and it will take you to the right spot typically. So GEOD equals, and we're going to say pi proj dot, and then chap capital GEOD for the actual class that we're going to be using. And we'll say ellipse equals WGS84. Now, does anybody remember what WGS84 is? It's the ellipsoid. Yep. That it's the ellipsoid used in the GPS system. Yep. So that's going to create us this GEOD object that we can use to do a conversion between two points and get the great circle distance and direction. So now we need to load the data. Now, if you remember last time we talked about the load txt command, it's not found right now if you do load txt question. By not doing dash dash pylab, we didn't bring in things like load text into this default space. So we're going to have to import them. And this I'm hoping we'll help you guys remember more about where load text came from. So when you try to write code with it, you'll find it. To get the directions, we'd have to say import numpy as np, like we have right up here. We'll have to do that same thing. So we'll go ahead and try this. So now if we do np period, if we type LOD and then tab, you see a couple different options. Don't actually run this command here. So this gives us the three options that could be, and load txt is one of those, so txt. And now we can do a question mark, and when you hit enter, you'll get the help for load text. So now this should be a cue to remind you that load text is coming from the NumPy module. If we scroll down, you can see all the different options explained. And for example, we're going to be using unpack with this xyz comma style unpacking into a bunch of variables. So let's go ahead and put that in here. So it would be just like last time, x, comma, y, comma, z. And if you don't remember the file, what's in there, we can say ls, we can do bang to run a bash command, bz cat, and then 2011 pipe head. So I'm going to go ahead and make this big for a second so you can all see it. So, the point so the exclamation point in here says, I want to run a bash shell command. So like we were back in the old shell that we started off with, and that way we can run the bz cat command we could have run from a terminal window regularly, and then we can just grab the first 10 lines with head. The nice thing is, by teaching you guys bash, it doesn't just go away when you switch to IPython. It just hides behind the exclamation point as a starting character in a line. So you can still get at those commands and use them if you want to. So this just gives us the first 10 lines of that, and in there, I have a comment for the first line that tells us what the fields are. And if somebody gives you data that doesn't have that first line, you go smack them on the head and tell them to give you a new file with an actual header line in there that you can understand. So this is telling us what each of these columns of data is for. Now today we're only going to care about the X and the Y. If we go back to our Emacs window, we can say, now we know that we have X, Y, Z, quality, satellites, and H dot. So we can put, put those in here, quality, this is commas between satellites h dot equals. And now we're going to use our load text command. And the first thing you give it is a file name. And that's going to be passed in through the argument to the function. So we'll say file name. And then we need to say unpack <coughs> equals true, which switches the way that it unpacks the data for us so that we'll actually get it broken out. If I, uh Command too long. How can I go with the next rule? Matlab is uh, three points. Uh, you can do that. Yep, that's exactly the same. Except for I think you have four there. Yes, three. But just three. Yeah, it's typically. Uh, actually, you know what? You don't even need that. I think you can do three points, but you can just if there's parentheses, it'll just work. So get rid of the three dots, and that's actually valid. Since there's an open parenthesis, I just hit enter. Just like that. That's pretty, uh, yeah, it's more advanced than some of the other stuff, so uh, we're not going to. It's not going to care about the indentation because you're inside of parentheses. 
The other thing you can do is make your Emacs wider and just write long lines is often convenient. So let's go ahead and try that. We'll save it with Control X, Control S, Control X, Control S. Remember there's no stars down here. And we'll go rerun this and I'm going to make it smaller so you guys can see that again. So we can see the code that's going on. And I like to write code in really small chunks. So I write a line or two, I try to run it, I see what happens. Because if you write, say, 100 lines of code and then you hit run, who knows what's going to happen in there. You might have 50 different errors that are interrelated and some of them might be just typos and some of them might be you put it together in kind of a funny way and then you might have to go back and rewrite 40 or 50 lines. So it's nice to start in small chunks if you can. So we'll do a reload, wander two. So I hit tab there again, and that reloads it. And now we can try to run the command again. So if I go up arrow to find it. So there was the command. And hopefully this will just run without causing any troubles. Nope, I already have a problem. So if you remember the load text was coming from this NumPy stuff and I didn't do it. So trying to follow this weird style is causing me problems too. So I'd imagine it's probably causing you guys some trouble. So we need an NP period in there to bring it in from that module. So that this way, by not doing this magical bring everything in and not know where it comes from, now when you're looking for documentation on load text, you know to go look for NumPy. And so you can Google on NumPy and you'll find it. So save that, reload it, and then rerun it. Right now, our function doesn't do anything other than load the data and then it gets deleted and disappears. But at least it's running correctly. So hopefully everybody hit enter. They got a little printout. Let's go ahead and add a function at the end that says print done loading file and then file name. So that's again a comma in here. So by doing that, when it's done loading the data, rather than just returning the prompt and you don't know where you went through, this sort of gives you a sense of where you left that function. So I just did a control X1 to hide the directory. We don't really need that anymore. Let's go ahead and try to calculate the centroid of all of our points. So we've loaded in all these X's and Y's. I'm going to grab this line so that we can play with it on the terminal again. So edit, copy, edit, paste, hit enter here. Oops. We need to change the file name to be our file. So 2011, press tab to finish that out, do a load. That way we have the data in our IPython shell to play with and try out our commands as we work through them. So the first command we're going to do is calculate the average of, of those. So we need to do average, except for now it's hiding behind NP. So NP average and then X. And this is going to calculate the average value of all those X's that are in there. What happened? You got booted out of uh, IPython, it looks like. Yeah. See how your prompt switched here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder what happened. Uh, so bring up your Emacs window where you have your code. I think there was a typo in here, maybe? So go back to your yep, terminal. Start IPython again. OK, import your wander2. Good. Now hit the up arrow to get your run command again. Keep going. So I ran np.average on x. So if you type like whose, press Enter. See how you have all those variables? Mm -hmm. So now you have to say np.average. So I ran another command okay. from numpy average and then of x. Unexpected indentation. OK, so on line 3, if we hit Control A to go to the beginning of your line, do you see how you have an extra space in there? So you have an extra space in all of your lines. Boots you out each time? Yeah, but I think I just fixed something in the file. Okay, well this is better. Uh, my, my lips, <laughs> my I had an I like it was. Uh, I had oh. an I right there, and that was kicking me out of IPython. It said program abnormally terminated. Oh, you so found it. Yeah, I, I removed that I. So let's try something real quick here. Okay. Good call finding that. That is an unfortunate behavior to do. There uh, we go. You got it. Thanks so, so much. Maybe that's. So we think we know what your problem was, and check your spelling of ellipse. Yeah, if you misspell ellipse, it doesn't just give you an error, it kicks out the whole program, which is really oh, a bad... So you have to spell it exactly like that, or you get completely... I think I'm going to file that as a bug to the proj author and say, please don't just throw us out completely. So now that we've uh, discovered a nice little bug in PyProj, this is something I often do in my code to do. File bug report with author. 
that's a note for me for later to go and chase that one down. So good job, guys, finding that bug and figuring out what it was. Uh, not always very much fun. So now we have our points loaded up correctly for everybody. Let's go ahead and use that average function that we had over here. So we're going to say xav equals np dot average of x and y av equals np dot average y. Now, I said this last time, but it, it's worth repeating. Calculations that are expensive, that take time, usually, you know, we're trying to abuse the computer and make it do the work for us. But if we calculated the average of 80,000 points every time we went through a loop, it suddenly turns into a very large number of calculations. So if you can calculate something once and save it into a variable, that's generally a good thing. So now we need to loop through all of our data. And this is one thing that's sort of classic of computer scientists that isn't necessarily the most friendly. We tend to use i as our counter through lists of things. It's not very intuitive until you see it in everybody's code a thousand times. So you're going to see it in my code too. It might be better to call something else, but I called it i in my notes. So I'm going to stick with my own notes and not try not to screw up. So we're going to say range of length x. Let's try that over here on the left. So we're working with this forward right down here. If you remember the range command, if we say range of 5, it's going to count 0 through 4. But we can also say we'd like a list of all the numbers that is the length of our array x. So we can say, actually we can just say length of x, and this tells us the length of the array x. So 86,000 points in our array. And we're going to want to look at every single point in that array. So we need a list of those. So we can say range. Now when I hit enter, you're going to see a lot of numbers go screaming by. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter, and then I'll bring back the command so you can see it again. There went 86,000 numbers across the screen. So we're going to use this to walk across our arrays. So now if we go back over here, we've got our for loop. It's going to walk and give us i is going to go through each value in our array. And we can now say d equals geod dot inverse xav yav. I'm going to write this out and then I'll explain to you what all the parts are. So we're going to use this geod object. We're going to use the inverse, which is going to take two different longitudes and latitude. And it'll compute the direction from the first one to the second one, the second one to the first one, so two different directions, and then give us the distance in meters between the two. So we've taken our average, so our centroid point of this cloud of points as our first point, and then we've gone into our x array to the ith point in that list, and we've grabbed the y array, the ith point, to go with it. So if you think about two arrays of numbers, so we have our x list and our y list, and we have at position 0 some number, at 1 we have some number, some number, 2, that's going to go on down, say, you know, 10,000, we have some number and some number, and it's going to grab these pairs. So it's going to grab that x and that y value out of there and use them to calculate the distance to our average of this. We have that blob of points. We have xav, comma yav is our centroid of this mess of ink blot test. We're going to get back something that's kind of a little funky, and I'm going to go just do another quick example to see it. So I'm going to do paste this in, import pyproj, try it out. I'm going to create one of these objects, meta w to copy, and I'm going to paste that in there. Whoops, don't do that. geod equals pyproj.geod ellipse equals wgs84. Or geod dot inverse, and I can say x zero y zero x minus one last point y minus one. This is the same example we did last time. So what we're doing here is we're just doing it once to see what we get back to make sure we understand the output. So this is going to be our direction in degrees. This is the backwards direction in degrees, and then this is the distance in meters between the two points. So what we want to do is take this d variable, which contains this list of three things, and grab the parts that we want to keep. So we need to be building a list of our directions and our distances. So we need to go and create a list that we're going to add to. So we'll say delta 
direction, so change in direction equals, and we're going to make an empty list, so nothing in it, and we're just going to start adding to the end of it, and delta m for meters, and also an empty list. So two empty lists, and we're going to keep adding points onto the end of those, and this is going to be our results that we're going to return back. So we want to return those back at the end when we're done. So at the bottom we'll say return delta dir comma delta m. So you can return any number of items back from a function. And in here, okay, so now we're going to go and take those values, so, and we're going to append them. So delta direction, and if we have a list, delta dir equals empty list, like that, we can append to it. So delta dir append 1.2345, whatever. You can add a number onto it, and then if you say delta direction, enter, we now have a list with one item on it, and we can append again with negative 9.4. Take a look at our list, and now we have a list. So you can keep adding onto it as we go through this. So we'll use our for loop to keep adding on numbers as we go through. We'll do append, and we'll take our D, and if we Scroll back up here a little bit. We're looking at output, this one that we want to grab from. So we want to grab our direction, which is the zero position, the first one. So D sub zero. And I'll put some spaces in there to make it a little bit more readable. And then we'll do the same thing for our meters. Append D and then it'd be, anyone want to say what number that is for this guy, our distance? What position is that in the array? Awesome, two. Okay, let's save that, and let's give it a try and see where we're at. I know ahead of time we're going to hit a bug, because there's something that we didn't think about yet, which is why it's nice to sort of write code slowly as you go. So we'll save this, Control x Control s Go back over here, scroll all the way down, and we need to reload it again. So reload wander2, and now if we try it again, we can do a Control r wander. So I'm doing a reverse search, that's a Control r I, know I've, I think I've showed you guys a couple times this. Reverse search in IPython is really nice to be able to go back through your history. Otherwise, when you start getting a lot of commands, you're going to have to look way back. So press CR inside of IPython, that's the control R, and then you start typing what you want, some part of it. <coughs> so I typed WAN for wander, and then you just keep hitting control R, and it will keep looking back through your history farther. And if you get frustrated with it and you don't find what you're looking for, you can hit control C and just type it from scratch. So I'll do control R and I found my old command that I like. If you just start moving the arrow keys back and forth, you can start editing that command and press enter. And you'll see that I'm gonna make this bigger because there's a error in there. Here's the command I ran. And I'm now gonna show you guys what a typical Python error message looks like because it takes some time to get used to these. They're there's a lot here. It's kind of overwhelming at first. You got a different error. Awesome. Global name delta is not defined. So if you look at your code, you have delta dir, delta m, and then if you go down here, you have delta dot dir instead of delta Oops. underscore dir. Thank you. So now getting an error message is the right thing. That's you got a couple easy. different things open. and no, it, So you had a different error message yeah. for range. Yep. OK, so you have a typographic error. So you've got 4i, and then you need to say in range. So you're missing the word in, in. So for i space in, which is in. And then you need to work on your indentation and you're missing a colon on the right. And you did a reload. Oh, unexpected, so it didn't reload there. See how you have an indentation error there? Right above your 26. So on line 16 over on the left, it says it has a funny indentation. And I can actually see it right here. See how you twist your indentation? So click right there, press tab. And see how it changed it for you? Okay. There you go. So then save that and try to reload. He has this invalid syntax, but his syntax looks the same as mine. <laughs> All right, let's take a peek. Oh, so this is the advantage I have for many years of staring at code that has lots of problems, uh -huh. uh, most of which is mine. Look at your Y sub I. See the GEOD line here? Look at, read that whole line, and when you get oh. to the end. <laughs> oh, there's no uh, parentheses. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I've, I've looked at code so much that things like that jump right out at me. And that's, that's nothing that like, you guys are going to be able to pick up immediately. It's just that after 20 years, your eyeball just starts noticing stuff quick. So it takes time to get used to seeing those. You don't have an error message. You're supposed to have a disaster. 
Wait, How come it's working? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a quick peek here. Your code is too good. Oh, I see it. See how many parentheses you've got going on there? Oh, this one? Yep. So, no, no, not square. Just you had too many parentheses. So you were making a list that only had one point in it, and so it looked at your list and didn't really make a. So you're not running that code. Um, you're actually running some other file somehow. Oh, you're reloading PyProj. Ah, there we go. See this? You're doing reload of PyProj. You need to do reload wander. Oh, there we go. Now, new and clever ways to cause trouble. Invalid syntax. I think you want a colon after your for loop. So let's take a look. Yep. I thought you had it. Watch your capitalization on your X. You have a lowercase x here, and you have a capital X there. Lowercase and capital are not the same. It's case sensitive. So let's take a peek at this error message. When dealing with Python, you're going to see a lot of these. And right now, it's going to look like messy stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense. And after you see a couple hundred of these, hopefully it'll mean a little bit more to you. The minute you see something like this, it says value error. This is the error it's reporting. Doesn't mean necessarily all that much. And what it's going to do is it's going to walk through your code and show you where it was. It starts off that you were in the IPython shell, and it's going to tell you you were in your wander2.py inside of this function, and it's going to show you you're on line 22 inside of this thing right here. So this is the code that we wrote. So there's something wrong happening in this line. Inside of this, if you look here, it says user lib py modules python27. This is not something we wrote. So this is that pyproj module that we were using that someone else wrote, we're now looking into their code. So we're getting to see their code, which we don't know. We've never seen it before. Once you start seeing something like that, don't expect to recognize the code or really want to go in there and debug it unless you really, really have to. So this says, OK, stop looking. When you start seeing that, you just sort of turn your brain off and say, eh. And we go down here. And the bottom, the value error comes back. You see the same error message come here. And it's got some text saying, what went wrong in terms of what it thought. And it says, undefined inverse geodesic may be an antipodal point. Anybody have any idea what that is? You all should get it. It should be really obvious, right? No. <laughs> it took me about 15 minutes of staring at it. So don't feel that this is something you should get. What I think happens here is that if you have two points at the same location, so we have a point that's right next to that centroid, it's so close that it thinks the direction doesn't make any sense. So they're at the same location, or they're exactly the opposite other side of the globe. So it's either at the same point or on the opposite side of the globe. And so direction doesn't make sense. So it freaks out and says, I don't know what to do. Kind of want to maybe do something for you. But I think that's probably the right answer is if you don't know the direction, is you just tell the user, this function doesn't work here. Typically, you wouldn't hit this stuff, but our average is right in the middle of our data. So some of our points are going to be right up next to our, our results. So I have to teach you guys a little bit about how to catch these kinds of exceptions. We're going to learn about try and how to catch problems and fix them as you go. So this is the cool thing about Python. And if you're in C or Fortran, your code would just blow up, and that'd be the end of the game. But in Python, if something goes wrong and you know how to fix it, you can say, I'll go ahead and grab that exception, and I'm going to do the right thing for you. So I'll show you the basic syntax. What you say is try. So this is what you're going to attempt is the stuff in here. And you have a, however many lines of code you need to protect. And then accept, colon. And here, you could say the, error, the specific error that you're going to catch. So you could say value error. Here, we're just going to say, if we see an error, we know what it was. And then this is the code that you write to correct the problem. And so only if something in here throws an exception does this code get called. So this is your sort of fix up the world and see if we can keep going. It turns out that a lot of times in Python, exceptions are a way to communicate like weird things that happen. And they're not always that bad. And you usually know how to fix them. You know, if a file's not found, you can tell the user, hey, you gave me the wrong file name. I don't find a file of that name, so you go fix it. So there's usually a way to, to do that. And we can try a quick example to see what that looks like. So we can say try, print, hello. And then there's a special function that I'm going to use called raise. 
if you find in your code that something is bad, you can say, hey, I'm going to throw up an exception and say, I don't know what to do. So this is kind of fun. You can say someone else's problem. I don't know how to fix this. So you can say raise. So we'll just go ahead and try a raise. And then we can have another line. So I hit four spaces to get it there. We will never get here. So this is the part that doesn't get run because we've raised an exception. And then accept is where we're going to catch that problem. Do not care. So here we've got our try block, things that we're going to try to do that could go wrong. If they go wrong, we're going to run the exception in here and we'll handle it here. And then we're going to go on after that. I think it'll make a little more sense when you see us actually using it in the code once we've tried it here to catch that exception where the points are too close together. And we actually know what the answer is then and we can tell it. So we'll hit enter twice here. And what you see, so we did the print hello, and we see hello down here. The raise gets called saying, oops, life is bad. Something bad happened. We jump down to the accept, and it runs the code that's in here for us. And we print, oops, we don't care. So it's not a big deal. So let's use this concept in our code. And I hope that this makes sense once you see it used. In our for loop, we're going to try. So I hit tab to get the indentation. So try, colon. Here I'm going to show you a nice trick of Emacs that makes indenting in Python a lot easier. So I'm going to hit control space. You'll see mark set at the bottom. I move the arrow key down to cover those three lines. And if you look up under the Python menu, there's this shift region right. It's control C greater than, or we can use this menu option. If you hit that, it indents the whole section by one more indent. So inside of that try, we'll set a control K in there to Get that set up. And I can hit tab here. And it's going to indent to that new block, but I want to actually back up for the accept. So I hit delete or backspace there. And you could say accept colon. Press enter. It now indents for us. In our case, we know those two points are right next to each other. Their distance is basically zero. And the direction, we can make up any direction. It doesn't really matter because direction doesn't mean anything. So we'll just pick zero north as our direction. So we can say delta append, and we'll just give it the number 0. So we're just going to go ahead and say, you know what, it's straight north, we don't care. Delta m append, and we do know that it's 0 meters away. So in our code now, anytime we get one of these exceptions, we're lucky here because I know there's only one type of exception that we're going to see, so we don't have to get too fancy. Anytime we have a problem, we just say, you know what, these points are at the same location. So let's go ahead and save it. We're going to reload. And if this works, we're going to see a lot of stuff go scrolling across the screen because it's going to return. All right, so I'm going to be brave. I'm going to hit Enter. And I'm going to hope it works. And if it works, you're going to see a whole lot of numbers go screaming by when it's done. So it's working through the data. Going, going, going. And there goes a lot of numbers. Not very fun to see all those numbers go by, but it means our code's going well. So now we need to capture those. So we can say direction, comma, m equals, and then our function. So that try except, every time we had a problem, we just assumed that that, number, those, that point was at the same location, and we knew what to do in that case. So we did a little fudge. Try and catch can really be useful. Like if you have a divide by zero case in your math, and you, if you know how to work through that, you can provide that information catch the, the divide by zero, do the right thing, and get the code back on track. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter and save those two variables. Um, so that's the bottom of your file there. So you actually have to return the two variables. So if you see hiding right behind his head down there, you got to return. And make sure they return. Yeah, go ahead and type it. And then it needs to indent. So hit tab on that line. And now hit backspace. And watch here. It says block closes. Hit it one more time back. Oh, For cool. loop. And then nice. it's showing you what's going on. And now you need to return your delta dir and your delta m. So if you take a look at um, right behind the screen where you can't see it, there's a return that needs to be at the end. You might have to stand up and look. So in here, after your print, there needs to be a return line that returns the delta dir and the delta m. So I would stand up and take a peek. Invalid syntax. So here you've got your x av. You're missing your y av right here. You're missing your y average. 
So now that we have some data that's actually useful, so now we have our direction and our m. We can say average of our distances in meters. And I remember that after I type this that I need to do np dot because I didn't do the dash dash pylab. Now that I've started doing the way I didn't like, now it's stuck in my head. So np dot average, that gives us 2.75 meters is the average distance from our centroid for our GPS. So depending on what you're doing with your GPS, if you're trying to do centimeter accuracy surveying with this GPS, you're out of luck. If you're trying to navigate a boat through a very large uh, ocean, it's great. We can also say min, and I think we can do an NP probably, and then M, let's see if that works. So 0, 0.0, that's not very exciting because we knew we had points that were at the same location, but more interesting is max. It gets as bad as 22.8 meters away. This GPS, when I looked at the data specifically, it was told us it was being a differential mode GPS. I don't believe it. 22 meters for a differential GPS near the coast is pretty bad. We have to go look at this GPS and figure out if it's misconfigured or if it's just lying about being in differential mode. More important than just looking at these numbers is plotting it up and taking a peek. So let's from matplotlib import pi plot. So that's going to get us our plotting functions, I hope. Pi plot. This is where I get into shaky ground because I use PyLab so much. Plot. So we're going to say pi plot. And I hit tab there to get this list of options. So don't, don't just run this one. This is what we want to run down here. And then M. So hopefully, cross your fingers, we hit enter, and we see nothing. What was going on before is it was in a mode where it wanted to show everything right away. And we have to now ask it to, to show. So we have to run a show command. And we'll now get a graph. So this is samples with time and the distance from that center point in our GPS, our hairball of points. So that's nice, but we also maybe want to do like a histogram. That might be a little bit better way of viewing this data since it's sort of hard to get a sense of, here's our terrible point, but we don't really have a good sense of how much of the time it's where. So we can do a histogram with pyplot.hist. So give that a shot. It takes at least one argument. So question mark. So we'll do pi plot hist and then m. It tells you all the bins it's making and does some patch stuff. And here are 10 bins. Now if you guys remember from undergraduate statistics and math, histograms are kind of unstable. They really depend on the number of bins that you've got. So let's try a different number of bins. Let's say bins equals, let's have 30 bins instead of 10. And the cool thing about this is until you clear the plot, you'll keep getting the plots on top of each other so you can keep seeing them. So you can see how your histogram changes with the number of bins. And it really starts showing you that this is the same data, but those histograms look very different. So let's try 100. So now this starts giving you the shape of your histogram and you can get a sense of where the points are. And click the X. There you go. Yep. So then you did um, the plot command. So do pi plot, PY, PL, tab dot plot, and then left parenthesis, and then M. I'm going to do a history here so you guys can see that. Since it goes running off the screen way too fast. Here's that first import. Then I did a plot, followed by a show. And then I had a graph and I wanted to get rid of it, so I clicked the X up here. And then I started doing my histograms down here. So histogram, the default is 10 bins. So that should give you a sense of how to do some really simple graphs. And it can give you a sense of how good your data is before you go and do some really heavy duty statistical analysis. Python has got all kinds of statistical tools, including it can reach into the R statistical package and grab all of those tools. So you can do skew, kurtosis, standard deviation, fitting. There's tons of stuff that you can do in here with all sorts of different data types. So we've got a few more minutes. I want to make sure everyone gets this stuff plotted. Now click the X to quit. And I think this is where Bree was talking about interactive mode last time. So click the X. Until you click the X at the top left, that close the window button. There you go. And so now all those things that you typed, it, it got to see them again. They all jumped up at once. Um, for some reason, it locks up the console. And I haven't figured that out. PyLab doesn't do that. 
uh, why we need this pound uh, interrogative pipe plot here? That was me asking it help. So what that's doing is it's hiding that command so it doesn't actually get run because it's just asking for help and it would get stuck. So it's putting a comment character in it, and so I use the question mark to ask for help. So definitely, you should be practicing with IPython, and you'll see those when you do histories. Anytime you ask for help on something, you should see a comment. Like if you use the question mark after anything, that's how it'll look in the history. That's a good question. So do a reload. Wander 2. Yep. Yeah. OK, and now run it. Did you import the plotting program? So from matplotlib import pyplot. And do pyplot.plot, left parenthesis, and then m. And now pyplot.show, and two parentheses. Look up there at number 41. And then when you're done with that, you click the, the orange red x up there. Uh, you found some good bugs today. So on Thursday, I'll have you guys turn in your log file that you've been keeping for this class. I mentioned earlier in the class that for each day, you need to have a log entry. And so on Thursday, you'll be copying that over to the research tool server. Yes. Sure. If you went back and you uh, go back in the lecture notes to the lecture we talked about IPython, I actually went through how to save a log. Or you can type history. Yeah. And you can paste it into your log file. So you're keeping an org mode log file for this class. Yeah. So you can create like a, a Python source block in your notes, and you can do history and just copy and paste that in there. Um, uh, I just want to make sure. I didn't see my name up there. I don't see anyone in here. Am I in the right? Oh, um, you're in research tools as opposed to UNH research tools. Oh. So jump, um, do a slash join of. Yeah, this is one of those, I think I probably should have called it U research tools, but we call it UNH research tools. So do a slash join UNH research tools. And there you see me. Oh, okay. Yeah, there so you I go. Just did research tools. Yeah. So did this exist or did I make? So if yeah, something doesn't, that's the one thing, it will just happily create, if there's nobody there, yeah. it just, you're the, you're the so one I just only person. Yeah. Something. Yeah. And the other thing, um, mm -hmm. is there a way to the history in um, mm -hmm. using it in the terminal? Is that a yeah? Command? So when you were, when you were at C, we went through that. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it, but the easiest one is just type uh, history space, and then see how you're on 45. Yeah. It's only going to show you the last couple, but you probably want all of them. Mm -hmm. So do uh, history question mark, and that'll give you help on it, and see how you can do history. N1, N2. Mm -hmm. So do a Q to get out of that. And now do history space 1 space 46 or 45. Yeah. And if you hit enter. And so now if you scroll back up, you'll see all of that. Oh, okay. Lucky people with mice. Okay. So I do you want this or sometimes I just take notes? And it I really, it's up to you. Or? So the thing I feel like I these notes is I just want you to think about the note concept and if. If you just gave me entries with nothing in there, okay. I'm actually okay with that. Okay. So it's what, what you think is going to benefit you the most. Okay. The idea of the notes is to have you guys explore the idea of taking log notes. And if you look at my log notes, I take thirty to 40,000 log notes per year. Okay. I, also, I, I don't know if that's a good habit or not. Mm -hmm. I guess from that level, I just start just taking notes in the itself. Sure. The one of the things that we've been trying to figure out how to organize the class, do you use something like Mercurial? Typically what I might suggest is put everything in Mercurial so you have notes like that, have it all in Dropbox, and it will just sync everywhere. Oh. And you can end up with some nice things where you've got history notes. And there's all these things that I would love to show you guys. I have this giant list of things that would help in your research. And w we could teach this class for two years straight, right. two days a week, yeah. and I would not run out of material. Yeah, sure. So Mercurial and things like that. So typically, like if you're building yourself a tree of stuff mm -hmm. that you've got, there's commands like find that lets you walk through a tree, find stuff, or you can write stuff in Python. There's Emacs commands to search trees of stuff. And so you're building up those notes. Wherever you put them, as long as it's text, it's easy to search. Cool. It just takes learning a couple commands. And so that's the goal that I'm trying to push you guys towards bit by bit. Mercurial is not yet covered.
You can make like simple GUIs in Python. To... Yeah, there's a couple different ways. Yeah. Like if you're working with the graphs, you can actually do stuff with Matplotlib for some simple GUIs, but there's also WX Python. The easiest yeah. place for that is Bash for file in star. And what I would typically do, since you don't have the extension on those, mm -hmm. um, do you have any extension on the files at all? No. So I would do something like, you know, make dir dot dot slash out, and then for file do, and you do something like cp dollar file dot dot slash out dollar. This is something that we do so often that yeah. It's like every time it's different, like a little variation, but yeah. so file, these are curly braces that I have a hard time doing, and then dot ti, or depending on whether you want two f's or one. Right. It depends on the software. Just See what it takes. Yeah, some of them, a lot of them will just do one. A lot of them will freak out with four characters, uh -huh. and then done. So this is exactly the, uh, what you're looking at there is you've got bash, and then you started IPython. Okay. So right you, in that window, you're in, two levels of shell, yeah. and so you use the bang to get back to a bash. Okay. 